Welcome to the uh, June 24th uh, virtual meeting of the NMRA PCR Coast Division. Um, really had just three items today. Um, the first of item was to do a little bit of a review of, of the Roaring Camp event that we did on the 17th. Um, I shall all talk about that. I have a little bit of talk about um, attendance, et cetera. Um, then a little bit on the uh, September 24th event we've got scheduled in the South Bay. Um, we need to start planning for that if anyone's interested in doing a, um, a clinic or something at that event. And then uh, just um, Coast Modeling Show and Tell. We don't have a formal guest on the agenda today. Um, so talk a little bit about um, the event on the 24th. Um, you know, we went down for essentially, um, we went down to, uh, to Santa Cruz essentially for two things. One was to go to Roaring Camp in the morning and then in the afternoon to have layout tours. Um, so I actually took a few pictures. So for those of you who didn't go, we had about, I, we actually only had about 10 people show up at Roaring Camp at the, uh, at the steam up, maybe 12. Um, so here are a few pictures. So this is kind of when we arrived, um, they had pulled out the, um, they had pulled out actually both the Heisler and the Shea. So this is the Shea. Um, they've got this, uh, this Plymouth here that they use to pull them out. Um, so they're sitting essentially cold in the, uh, out in the driveway. So this was about 8.30 in the morning. Um, so a couple of pictures there um, of the engines. Um, this, and I've got, a, I've got a video I'll put on in a second so you can see a little bit more about what's going on here. Um, you know, this, was their, this is their speeder few of the other other cars that are there you can see the train cars in the background there so that was kind of when we showed up um and I'll, like i said i've got a couple of videos of the steam up um some interesting things we learned as they they were steaming up the engine and showing us how they get going in the morning um basically we came back at 11 um 10 o'clock we got together with the uh with the guys the live steam guys and then at 11 o'clock came back and um uh, phil who's the guy on the left there you kind of see behind um, is their chief mechanic, and he did a, a shop tour for us. So this is the shop, um, kind of looking out the, uh, the back of the shop in front there. On the left side, that's the other Shea. I think it's number seven. Um, that one, actually, they pulled the boiler out of, and the boiler is up in Washington being rebuilt. They're going to get it back in six months and then you know, put it back together. Um, so basically walk in. Um, you know, interesting, there's no better shot of the Shea there, talked about, you know, the rebuilding efforts they go through, kind of the maintenance, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one thing that's really interesting is to look at this. This is the floor. And basically, if you want to change out the brake shoes, you've got to crawl under the engine in the grease on the floor. Um, so basically, there was a lot of commentary about wanting to have a pit. And in fact, they're they have plans to build a new maintenance building um, behind, which will be actually from the current shop building and the direction towards where the main um, Rory Camp station and that is Be behind that building, actually building a whole new shop building that'll have bits in it and better ability to do heavy maintenance. Um, this is the, the little engine they only run occasionally because it actually doesn't have a compressor. They have to, actually put a, an, it actually have to have another engine pump up the brakes on a car to be able to use it because they actually have the air brake system but no compressor. Um, kind of typical equipment, they have a couple of mills, one lathe. Um, what was interesting was they have a couple of 20-ish, you know, older 20-ish guys that are there as part of the team and one of them actually bought this mill to learn how to do machining. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that there's a younger group that's there. So, um, let me, let me stop that. And what I'm going to do is I wanted to share a couple of videos. I thought, oh, is this interesting? Just by the way, is this kind of stuff interesting to see? This is kind of, kind of what everybody missed. If you didn't go, it was, it was, it was, I thought it was, it was more interesting actually in a way than I thought it would be. Um, and hang on here. Okay, so this problem with these is I have to change them from um, from Apple Video to MP4 so you can play them. Back, back 
Yeah. I'm going to turn the volume down. But this that was Phil. This thing just is like young bull. Makes it nice to do little videos. But but it's kind of it's it was pretty interesting just you know seeing this the sound you hear by the way is the um, so the Plymouth the running process everybody goes through. Yeah, it's a, it's a fire process right now. We're gonna hook up the gas service to this thing, light it off on natural gas. So, so that was an interesting comment is if you look if you look there on the if you look at the very bottom right of the picture and notice that valve with an attachment that's actually for a natural gas hose and so you know they don't have you know back in the day apparently you know they would keep outside the roundhouse or somewhere or in the roundhouse they would have a boiler that was kept hot and they would use the steam from that to fire the engines because Basically, you can't you can't um, atomize the oil. The oil gets atomized by a steam spray that atomizes in the burner, so it'll burn. You can't do that until you have steam set until you actually steamed up. So, because they don't keep a boiler set, they actually use natural gas and they switch the burners over from oil to natural gas. Connect the hose up and fire them with natural gas to get them up to temperature. And then and then disconnect that and flip them back over to the oil because now they've got the steam pressure to atomize the oil. Now, it was converted, I assume, to oil then. Or... 1963 when it first arrived here. Wow. Yeah, that seems to be pretty common now. Yeah. yeah. And you don't want to be going in the trees and throwing at, throwing cinders exactly. out in the trees. The kind of grades that we run here, you know. If we fired coal, first we'd kill our firemen off, second we'd yep. set the forest on fire. Exactly. <clears throat> no, that's good. Iceland's converted to oil in 1904, originally wood fired. So it's been an oil burner most of its existence. Chase 7s always was an oil burner. No, it, you know, it, it, the, the whole thing about the coal and the cinders from the Colorado railroads was kind of a thing. But the challenge is it's just too dangerous in the forest. Yeah. And, uh, and the company, in the end, it's the companies that end up changing it almost faster because of the liability issues that they have. So. The South Pacific Railroad itself became a oil fired road from about 1890 on out. Yeah. In the steam. And they discovered very early on that handling oil was so much cleaner and less expensive. Yep. Exactly. Hang on, I gotta stop that one. So is that so? Do you want to see another one, or is that because I did about three or four of these? I, I'm gonna put them together into a bigger video. I just, quite frankly, haven't had the time to do it. Uh, um, I'm happy to see more. Those are great. That, um, yeah, it's it's kind of cool. It's there. there are, a couple of the others are better too. So we we'll just hey, kind of continue. Everyone, if you turn on your class closed captioning, you could understand what he was saying. <laughs> yep. This is him. This is him actually lighting it off, getting ready to fire it up. 
And you notice now the, the natural gas hose is attached. So is that a separate burner then for the natural gas? That's the same burner. Same burner? Just run the natural gas through it before the fuel. Plug it right directly into the burner and we can control it with the firing valve up here. And then uh, we'll swap it over to oil later on. Cool. When we're burning oil, we need steam to run an atomizer to atomize the oil, uh, make it into kind of like a yep, fog yep. or a mist. And with no steam on the engine, that doesn't work too good. So, <laughs> so you steam it up with the natural gas. gas. We'll the steam filter up and then we'll switch it over here. And... Cool. Yeah. I'll run half the thing. That's good. Yeah. yeah. We can just spend, spend the time checking everything out. That, that would be fun to have in your backyard. Did Fran go? Yeah, Fran actually went. He was there. I actually wasn't there when, when I did this. He hadn't gotten there yet. And I actually was doing this for him. But then he actually did come. Yeah. I mean, he loves these critters. So. Yeah. Yeah, oh no, exactly. Well, and they have a couple of them there, so. Okay, that's that one. Let's see, I got one, a couple more here. I'm actually trying to encode them as we're talking so that they're right. Yeah. Uh, let's see, this should be three. This one's.
So cool. But this this beam at the end they redid. I thought that was pretty interesting, kind of laminated and the end beam there on the Heisler. So I think I have one more of those, I think. And then there is uh, one of the shop, I think. This was, this was good. This is them greasing. I mean, basically they use a whole container of grease greasing the engine every morning. I think they said they, how much grease they use. They use a lot of grease.
And let's see, I think I've got one with a little bit of the shop tour here. I didn't do a lot there. I just. Still run run the parking lot shuttle that same way. Oh yeah, I know. Um, when they had the uh, comments, I said, yeah, yeah, that's the best ride right there. <laughs> we did that last year. She doesn't have air brakes. She has a steam brake, but what we did last year for air brakes is we had the little Milwaukee. Yes. We used it as a as a floating air compressor. <laughs> um, you know, charge up the brakes. So we have a dump valve here in case we needed to stop or yeah. we yeah. stop. Well, I, I think that isn't that Milwaukee still used sometimes oh, yeah. when you have a heavy train. What one pause here just for a second. So this tank on the back of seven, the sand tank, apparently the tank is aluminum, and those pieces at the bottom that are actually where the the distribution is were actually uh, steel or iron, one or the other. And apparently when they welded those those welds right there, you see. So on the bottom right where you see the the with the the sand tank with the seven on it where it's connected those wells actually are porous enough that when they spill water when they're filling the water tank and they spill water and it it drops down on here and runs down the side it actually goes in through capillary action through the wells and gets the sand wet and the sand clogs there so they were talking about re-welding it I, I don't know if it was spots it was it was a welding technique that to allow them to weld that so it's not permeable so they don't get wet sand because apparently that's a, been a big issue with that engine. So it's kind of an interesting thing about the challenges you have, you know, as you start using new materials instead of the steel they probably used 100 years ago for that. Somebody got the bright idea we can do it with aluminum easier, but now you have, uh, you know, different metals and, a metal, and metal welding issues. So interesting kind of the challenges. Uh, the other thing we talked about was, and I, I don't know if you've got a good picture of it. I, I think Fran actually had a really good, Fran or Jake, one of the other guys had a better picture of it. The, the back of this engine, the wood bolsters there are wood beams on the end of the engine. There are three of them. They actually need to replace those. And you know, you're saying that's probably a week or two job for two people to unbolt those three beams, form the new ones, put them in rebolt them all up. So it gives you kind of an idea of how much work it is rebuilding something like that. Anyway, I'll let it run. This is Milwaukee for work train yeah. service. Um, it's actually a West Side locomotive. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it pushing, pushing the, the frame behind the, the I work on it. It's kind of a four year old great car. Little, little quick engine. Milwaukee looks like a, a, a motor car on steroids. <laughs> so yeah, this is So I need to take this apart, new, get new, new ones cut. Um, at the same time, I need to take the sand hopper off. What the West Side Lumber Company did, and you can see it, is they used the original cast iron bases. And they oh, here he's talking them, about it. And they tried welding the steel to the cast iron. I'm sorry, I lost the last of that. So I, I've got a couple of others, but they're not completely encoded or covered. Um, I took a few pictures of the layouts. I don't know if there's interest in that. That's, uh, but that's kind of what I had from it. But it was very interesting. I thought it was very worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Looks like they could tidy up their shop a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. It, 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 it's a little uh, rough. Is probably you know kind of the right word yeah so some of the i don't know if there's interest here are some of the layout um let me i can share this and we can 
And I, I, I'll have to try to remember exactly whose layout each one is. That's always a challenge. Um, so this is, I think this is Guy, this is Guy Cantwell's layout. Or no, actually, this is Mike Musel's um, ON3, ON3 layout. Um, so I don't know if you know, if you have met Mike, Mike's an interesting guy. He was a professional model maker that worked in Silicon Valley, you know, like building prototype models for iPhones and that kind of stuff. And then when he retired, basically took his shop and turned it into a model railroad. And, uh, it's very, you know, under construction, but very, it would be a very nice, uh, you know, ON3, um, railroad. This is actually Guy Cantwell. Um, Guy Cantwell's layout was an HO layout, made it more operationally focused. Um, and so he's got a few pictures of that. Um, this is, um, I'm just going to pull a blank here. Um, he has, he has both an HO layout and a, and a fairly large outdoor garden layout. And I'm just pulling a blank right now. And um, very nice location. Uh, I'm not sure he's going to be open again because he's kind of migrated away from the, the HO layout. Um, and this is actually the outside. The, the over here on this area over here is where the uh, garden railway is. And then the HO layout is actually in a building right over here, right here. You kind of can't see that well. Um, and I'm trying to remember who else, whose layout each one of these is. This is, um, hang on, let me, let me pull up my name so I know what I know who I'm talking about here. This is, this is um, Wayne McMillan's layout. Hmm. And, um, and the, the other one was actually John LaBarba. Um, his layout and um, and I try to pull back which one this is I think this may may have been Wayne's um, as well Wayne Wayne McMillan's which is kind of dug in under the house in the side and I had one last picture I'll show this is this is kind of yes there's hope for the hobby this is the ACCRS club in Pleasanton I think it was Thursday night um, open for the public at the fair. And what's interesting is if you look at the group of folks here, um, this guy's actually a dad of the guy, the young man sitting next to him. But if you kind of look down here, got three guys that are all in their 20s and late mid 20s to 30, early 30s. Um, and actually have the same thing. So it's a, one of the things that's really interesting is have actually quite a recent surge in young members. So I thought that was actually kind of good news and took a picture of it. So anyway, that's kind of, that's kind of what it was from the, the standpoint of the trip. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of, the, the steam up thing like that you, you know, when you walk around, you look at the engine and that you don't get to talk to the guys about how they maintain it and how they do it. I thought the whole process of using the natural gas to steam it up was very interesting. Um, and seeing the shop was interesting and kind of understanding what they go through. Um, I didn't get it reported. They talked about the brakes. They used to have cast brakes that were apparently very expensive. And now they've figured out how to use standard, um, you know, current modern composite brake shoes. And uh, they said the cost has dropped dramatically and they last five times as long. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to understand how they're kind of incorporating modern technology into what, you know, essentially are now probably... 120, 130 year old technology. So that was kind of fun. Um, and I did not do the train ride because it turned out they didn't have a ticket and they were sold out. And I wanted to be able to go see all the, uh, the layouts as well. So I, I spent a little more time because I wanted to go see everybody and make sure I talked to them. And I got everywhere except Salinas. I didn't get down to the Salinas club. So I have to go down there at some point in the future. So. so Phil, I was at I was at Dave Lovelace's on uh, Saturday for that open house. Did you make it to Dave's again? I made it to Dave's, but I made it there at five o'clock, and and I everybody rang the doorbell, yeah. and everybody was everybody was gone. And I just I left the certificate uh. for him on the uh, <laughs> on his stoop because I 
I pulled up and somebody arrived and went in the house. And I went up and I rang the doorbell about four times. We got closed up and nobody came. So I figured because I wanted to give Dave a certificate for being open. And yeah, we um, had a we had a few people, but the idea the idea there was not to just show the layout. It was to hand anybody who walked through the door a throttle. Give them a cab. <laughs> yep. And Dave's and Dave's level is, Dave's layout is that way. And that's yeah. one of the nice things you get to see is and see that. And by the way, you know, one of the things that's interesting is Dave's layout is generally open. I mean, Dave's layout is generally open for bay rails. Mm -hmm. Um it, probably available if you contact him for other operating sessions. Um, definitely in the convention, I would imagine he may be one of the layouts that'll be open during the convention um next year to to operate. So it's cool going to see. That's one of those layouts that's nice to go see as an open house because you can see if, hey, would I like to come back here and operate? Because you get an idea of not only the layout, but the operating scheme and, you know, how complicated and uh, rigorous it is. Let's well, say. But the, the thing is, the thing is, it's not complicated. That's the beauty of it. That's no, the, no, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, because the, the cool thing about Dave's is you can hand anybody a throttle, right? Yeah. Even guys that are intimidated by operating. Right. And I think it takes away some of that fear because you can hand them a throttle right. and and they're they can they're off and running a train. Yep. It's it's pretty it's you know, next thing you know, you see big grins on their face. Right. When they were afraid yep. to get to handle the throttle in the first place. So that's why I think uh, it's good for people to visit his layout and, and for us and, to uh, run it that way. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and when the thing about it is that, you know, we talked about doing operating sessions for the convention. One of the things I've talked to Seth about is trying to have three options every day and kind of rank them by, and I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out the right terminology. Mm. So I use, you know, casual, moderate, and intense. And so, you know, <laughs> it, it, you know but, but the whole thing is if you're running, you know, a, a heavy duty timetable train order layout with, with, where you have a lot of trains, a lot of rules and that it, it takes someone having an understanding of the underlying process where, you know, I think Dave's Dave's is a much more casual kind well, yeah, of. You, yeah. You can run, you can run TG and TO at Dave's and we do, but, but the nice thing is when we ran it for Bay rails, just ran it uh, without right. the TG and TO so that people could come in and, you know, who didn't know the railroad. Right. Exactly. And, and it still runs. Yep. And, and I think that's, that's one of the things from an operations perspective, yeah, I, I always tell the story of I, you know, I'd gotten back into model railroading. Somehow I got an invite or saw something about Bay Rails. I sent in, I sent in a thing to do Bay Rails. I, you know, I didn't know anything. I checked some layouts, and all of a sudden I get an invitation that, you know, you've been you've been assigned to so and so for an operating session, and I get a great invitation. They sent a welcome to my layout. I um, you know, it's great to have you operate. We're a casual group. We operate very. I've attached our rule book and our operating <laughs> procedures and the rule book was 78 pages. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, am I really expected to understand this? You know, and, and, and between us, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a fairly confident person, but it was a little bit of kind of what am I getting myself into? And if I'd been a little more trep, had more trepidation about the whole process, it, it probably could have been a little bit off putting. Oh yeah. Um, so, you know, the idea is to say, you know, have somebody go to, it's the same thing we were trying to do at the convention in 2020. We were trying to set up the ON30 layout to do some, you know, operations, which really is just take a train out, do some switching and bring it back to the yard. Um, because really it's the idea of getting somebody in to understand the side of what operations does, I think for us is it gives us an opportunity to think in a different way than your model building. For those of us that are retired, it's actually an opportunity to, to challenge your brain to think through a process. And I think that's really good for us. We don't, we, you know, as you get older, you don't do that as much. You kind of atrophy that. And when you do, when you do operations, it, it lets you think and do things you don't normally do. And that becomes fun and, and is interesting. And so to my mind, getting people excited about doing operations is good because it, for all of us, it does two things. It introduces you to another social group. It challenges you to think more, be logical. And, and I think those things are good. I think it's just, you know, I personally think exercising your brain is no different than exercising your body as you get older. If you, if you ignore either, they're just going to atrophy. I, I, I agree. I agree. And uh, it's one of the reasons I think operations is fun for a lot of guys is yep. it keeps, it keeps the brain going. 
Uh, I hesitate to use the word puzzles, but it is a puzzle. Although people think of puzzles like you know the time saver, and now how do I how do I make this work? So, but it's a puzzle in the sense that, uh, in fact, I was talking with one of the visitors at Dave's who had not operated before, and he was watching me switch. And, and I said, you know, the interesting thing about how the cars move is, although the trains are the same, the car movements are always different. So every time yep. you take a train into this town, you've got different movement. So you've yep. got to think it through. And, yep. you know, you can challenge yourself. Can I do it in fewer moves? How quick? And the nice thing is, you know, if you don't know what you're doing and you take three hours to switch, it doesn't affect the rest of the railroad. Right. So you can, you know, you can uh, take your time at it and, and get better at it. So I, yep. I, I just think it keeps the brain going. Yep. And, and then right. once you get beyond that, when you get to the, like the larger peddler freight that goes out and back, you know, deciding when you're going to do cars based on whether it's trailing or leading point switching exactly on a run and those thought and the, you know and, and so what's interesting is you realize that there's a whole bunch of thought process that goes into this and then you kind of figure it out you say oh you do it that way and it's more efficient and yeah it's it, and then and then it becomes then once you've got that down then it becomes the next challenge is okay we're going to do timetable and now you've got to worry about you know, I'm stopping here and I'm waiting for this train or I'm getting orders and and it adds to kind of a, a large logic complexity, which is is fun. So anyway, I think Dave's Dave's layout is very good for seeing that because you kind of see a layout that, you know, you can operate on in a larger way. So, yeah, anyway, so yeah, so I, yeah, and I'm glad we got some visitors. I mean, we weren't sure because it is a little bit further out, but um, but we did get some visitors. So I thought that was good. Yeah, it, it, it was fun. Yeah, I was down at Dave's actually during Bay Rails. So that was... Yeah, you know, I saw you there. Of, yeah. And and so, you know, I think the... And again, I think if somebody was willing, this was kind of the conversation we had before. I um, mean, you know, I, I will say disappointed is kind of not the right word because that sounds like it's personal. I, I, I was surprised that we didn't have more people make the trip over the hill. I thought the combination of you know, doing the stuff at Roaring Camp that you normally can't do. You know, if you go to Roaring Camp, you kind of walk out and the trains are there and you can walk around the engine and look at it. But, you know, being able to go through the steam up and see how they maintain, I thought that was, that okay. would be of, of interest. And then combining that with, you know, having seven layouts open that some of them are very nice um, would be good. And so I was surprised that we didn't get more folks that came over, uh, but it's a good learning experience. I think it, it's a learning about, you know, in our community, how willing people are to travel. As we were talking about before we started, you know, one of the things we were thinking about in the convention is having one day where we would have a South Coast set of layout tours for the convention. And real question is, you know, will there be enough people willing at a convention to drive, you know, if you get off at 1215 to drive the 45 minutes to Sakel to do a set of layout tours down there and then drive back up you know, at, at five o'clock, say from Morgan Hill to come back up the bay, up to Mopitas. So that's actually a, a fairly interesting question because, you know, one of the things is that we don't want to disappoint the layout owners. I mean, you just, uh, there were a couple of people, there was actually one or two comments on emails afterwards of being a bit disappointed in the attendance. And, and so, you know, that's one of the thought processes is how do we, um, how do we make sure that, we don't we well, if we do it again we have enough people come so anyway i i thought it was personally i thought i had a lot of fun i enjoyed it i i learned learned a lot of things that probably are not very relevant to my life but were fun to learn about servicing shays and starting them up and maintaining them and and uh and realized realized that while it's glamorous to think about being a railroad mechanic in real life it's a lot of climbing, crawling around in grease on the floor. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was noticing the, you know, the, the the oiliness of the cabs and the guys wearing their uh, their uh, uh, belts for uh, you know for for lifting and and you know it's a it's rough work. I mean, and and, that, and those are oiled. I mean, it's a good thing they're not shoveling coal or or right or doing anything else. So, yeah, um, but it's just it, yeah, it's dirty and it's a lot of heavy work, obviously. Yeah. So you were mentioning the carpooling earlier, you know, and, and there's the, the whole issue of liability or whatever. Although um, many, many guys carpool down to Dave's, right, down to yep. Watsonville. And I got to say that one way to spice it up is, you know, if there's three or four guys in an SUV trucking on down to Dave's for 45 minutes, 
Um, you mentioned, you know, the uh, the fun thing about operations or the hobby in general is the community. Yep. And we always have a good chatter for those 45 minutes. There's always a, there's always good stuff to talk about um, on the way down and on the way back. So I find the drive just as much fun as as the operating session because, you know, you're hanging out with fellow fellow uh, fanatics and, and always always having a good conversation and, and some good laughs, too. Yeah. So so um, so the, the drive isn't necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, I think, I, you know, one of the things I need to understand, and you know, and and you guys probably observe this about me is when somebody says this is the rule, my first reaction is to figure out what's the way around it. <laughs> um, so what I'm thinking about for the convention next year is either doing something like on groups.io and making a convention group and anybody who goes to the convention can go join that group and then letting people do it on their own to talk about carpooling. Um, I also am going to look at the, the narrow gauge conventions using an app called Wahova, which is a one of these online convention conference apps that you can get where, you know, everybody registers and you've got a bulletin board, you've got all of that. And, and the idea really is to say, look, if you guys want to do carpools, you know, go ahead and do it yourselves. We're not involved. Therefore, you know, we're not we're not arranging them for you. You have to do it yourself. So what? Uh, and I, I just got to check with Ash. What I find is from an NMRA perspective, you, you kind of have to check because I, I find that there are things that I think are logical that are not as logical to other people. And I think the difference is I'm not a lawyer. So, <laughs> um, Bill, speaking about lawyers, okay, and, and arranging carpools, um, I was just thinking, okay, if the convention wants to arrange carpools, and right now you say you don't want to do it because of liability. How about going and getting a lawyer to write a boilerplate waiver that people can sign? So that way the convention can go ahead and arrange carpools, but the people who take those carpools then waive any liability to the convention. Uh, that's an interesting idea. That's actually an interesting thought. If you had, if you, you know, and, and maybe that's the idea of saying that you have something like a groups.io and as part of joining the groups.io, you have to say that the groups.io is being provided for use and there's no, takes no responsibility for anything that may occur because of it or something. I, yeah, that's, yeah, you that's an interesting it. thing. I, you can hire those ocean guys that wrote the one for the guys going down the submersible because apparently that was a real good waiver of liability. <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have said that. This is not a recording. That was <laughs> so inappropriate. Yeah. I know to... I know attorneys who are good enough to uh, penetrate <laughs> any waiver. Yeah, that's that's the real problem, is that the, the waivers right. the, the waivers are good until some until somebody dies and then everybody's in court. Well, not getting into the legal shit, but it has to do with you know negligence, right? The waiver oh. says, you know, and, and I don't know anybody. Uh, of course, maybe I shouldn't name names, or maybe there are a few I wouldn't want to drive with. But uh, the question is whether or not you know they're negligent. That's how you penetrate those right. things because no, you, you, you can't absolve someone from being an idiot. And, and, and you know, quite frankly, you know, we have this weird view of this stuff. Is why are people concerned about this? The reason is that there are organizations, there are groups that gather data about what's happening, and somebody who ran a conference got sued, and that got communicated. You know, it's just like, why, why, why did the NMRA come out with a policy about having children involved yeah. in activities because of what happened to the Boy Scouts? It's kind of the tale there is, you know, your liability if someone does something is huge under your watch. And so the best way to do it was perceived to be block the, any opportunity. So kind of, the, I think the carpool thing that kind of probably happened the same way. I bet somewhere at some event, somebody put up a thing and did carpools. Somebody had an accident and the, the people that did the convention got sued and that got put up. So everybody who runs conventions sees that. And so anyway, well, well, I, like I said, I think if you, it, it, I think as long as people do it on their own and somebody posts up and says, Hey, I'm planning on going on the South coast. Exactly. Tour, you know, and then people just talk about it. You know, it, it's the, the question is what's the level of facilitation that you provided? So, you know, I think I think if you put up a carpool list as a sign, you're specifically enabling carpools. If you put together you know, a social network and say, you know, whatever you want to talk about, you can talk about there, for example, meeting up at the convention, looking at a clinic, carpooling to an event, and you just basically present it as a tool. 
but we're not telling you how to use it. We're letting you use it. And I think that reduces it more. I hope, but we'll see. I, I'm going to have to ask the question because. Well, I remember, my, you know, John Goodrich is a litigator and uh, uh, John once told me, he said, you know, if someone decided that they were walking down the street, tripped over a crack while they were thinking about you, they can sue you for it. Right. So yeah. uh, we're in a country that you can say anybody can sue anybody for anything. It doesn't mean they're going to win, but it does right. create a lot of a lot of uh, hassle for the organization. Right. Well, and, and that's why, you know, so many of those kind of suits get settled out of court because. For the insurance company, you know, if you're a store and somebody slips and falls and they put a suit in, the insurance company really quickly looks at it, do the benefit analysis and says, it's worth paying $20,000 to settle this versus paying the lawyers to try to do anything. That's right. And so, and it, and it, unfortunately, it's very sad, but true. But a lot of those things are kind of just done for expediency and, and value. So anyway, it, like I said, I think it was a it was a great event. I was hoping we I was hoping Fran or, or Jay or a couple of the other folks that were there would come on, but I I thought it was fun. I wish we'd had more people. I think people would have enjoyed it more. Um, on the other hand, by the way, having twelve people and going in the shop was really great because <laughs> you know you could see from the pictures, the videos, there was not very many people there. So, all uh, I've got to say is I would have been there except it's the one day of the year that they had the Bay Area prototype modelers meet. Yeah, that was the RPM meet uh, that week. Now, did, it, did, anybody, did anybody figure out if the COVID was at the RPM meet or was the Carquinez Model Railroad guys? Because, you know, five guys from CMRS came down with COVID after that. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, I know Robert Lopez put a... Uh, a thing on the ACCRS thing because we're open for the fair and we got a lot of people coming in. He said, you know, anybody who went there, be, be aware that there were five folks that came back from, from Carquinez Club that had COVID after that. So now the question is, you know, did they carpool together and get COVID by themselves or did they get it at the event and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, but I think you're good now. I think Saturday, it was last Sunday. So in all probability, if you haven't gotten sick by now, you probably didn't get anything, I hope. But yeah, that's, that's one of the challenges is that it's still, you know, COVID is still out there. So how was the RPM meet though? Notwithstanding getting COVID. Did, you were there, Ken? <laughs> it was pretty good. Actually, it was, it was excellent. I don't, the, 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 the clinics were of no interest to me, unfortunately. It just, they were dealt dealing with modern prototype stuff and I'm not, particularly interested in but i got to meet and see a lot of people and i i brought my my last and latest uh uh freight car project which is a pfe um r40-26 uh plug door reefer uh that i've been working on for about three months mm. rebuilding an accurail kit mm, yeah. um I'm not going to show it because it sort of came apart uh, on the <laughs> and, uh, after on the way back from the show. I haven't put it back together yet. Um, also, the other group that I'm very involved with, which is this uh, recreation or, or creation of a um, stand-in, a Harriman stand-in uh, for from a, a Bachman two eight zero. And we've been going at it for about two, almost three years, largely interrupted by the, the, the pandemic. But um, we're getting close. And right now we're using 3D printing to uh, uh, create uh, whaleback tenders in aid show and things like that that you would haven't seen since brass. Uh, and it, it, it's it's a, it's an interesting uh, thing. But uh, anyway, we were able to do a lot of stuff about that, show a little bit about that. Cool. Plus, there was a huge number of people there. Good. Surprisingly. Younger, any, some younger guys? I'm like, uh, I'm like uh, Phil, too. I, uh, I like seeing the younger people into the hobby. I'm wondering if there were a number of them there at the RPM meet. Yeah, a lot of younger people displaying. Good, excellent. You know, you know, I think that's that's the really interesting thing is that 
there's a there's a real bifurcation in the hobby of of I'll call it the older generation being more more I think a lot more focused on you know older prototypes narrow gauge steam etc where the young folks that are coming in you know are much more modern prototype focused and I think that's one of the things we we don't necessarily co-join those very well well you know it's it's interesting um most of us the track prototype hasn't changed that much unless you really want to go to concrete ties right and um yeah if you try to model prototype operations of the current peer, uh you know railroads i mean you've really got some rather negative uh, things going on <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um I'm finding that there, there actually is a small fraction of these younger people who were interested in historical prototype. Right. I, I think it may also be a progression too, right? Because yeah. you know, yeah. you get into mod if you're younger, you get into model. So yeah, beginning to have this theory that that model railroaders have really two interest levels. Either you're a modeler or you're interested in railroads. And if you yeah. think about those kind of as Venn diagrams, right? of your interest, what's the overlap in individuals? And, you know, so I think the the thing that's interesting is that when you come in the, like the RPM guys are modelers probably in many ways first and come in modeling the prototypes, the railroads they've seen. So they're interested in railroads, but more from a modeling perspective. Then the question is when you become operations focused, do you realize that the operations on the model railroads uh, have become I will argue both very more difficult to model effectively or replicate effectively and are less intellectually. I'm 80 years old and I've been in both camps. I'm back to prototype modeling. No, I'm talking about from an operations perspective. In other words, in other words, it's really hard to model hundred car unit trains in terms yeah. of having a layout that's big enough to model it's boring what, too and and then that's that's my other side is that you know what railroads have become is basically high volume automated long <laughs> long cycle long cycle right the, is there's what the railroads is virtually nothing they deliver has any expediency today but if you yeah. think about it if i'm delivering if i'm if i'm moving a unit oil train or a unit whatever train across the country getting it there whether it gets there in 24 hours or 28 hours probably doesn't matter or how many ever hours it is in other words it, it, it's less about expediency and more about volume yeah it's bulk bulk you know bulk even amtrak has 12 hour delays right and 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 it's because amtrak's running on on tracks that are from a business perspective being operated you know, I don't care if the train runs 40 miles an hour if nobody cares when the loads get there. And if it's safer at 40 miles an hour, more cost effective versus 60, if nobody complains about when stuff gets there, I tell you, look, it's going to take two weeks. If I've got a chain of cars coming to me, whether there's yeah. 10 days or two weeks in the pipeline of the railroad, is just a little bit of asset value sitting there. Because I just build my business around. It takes two weeks to get there. We've got a two-week inventory on the railroad. And as long as it gets there in two weeks, I'm in good shape. And so I think, you know, I think the thing yeah. that's so interesting is a lot of the things that we get excited about in operations, you know, and they allow you to do interesting things. For example, doing fruit operations where you say, okay, I'm going to have a car and I got to move it to the icing station. Then I've got to move it and I've got to pick stuff up and it's got to get on the road within this amount of time and it's got to be delivered in this amount of time those constraints to the business model, which existed for railroads back in the fifties, I don't think exists for the railroads today. It's a different business model completely. And I, I think that's, so I think what's interesting, what, one of the questions would be interesting is, you know, do guys get into, do some of the younger guys get into the prototype modeling to model the railroads, the prototypes yeah. they see, but then as they get involved, say, gee, maybe I should look at these historical for the operations yeah. or, 
Anyway, it's an interesting question. Uh, Phil, I've been involved in, in prototype operations, in logistics and, and, and actual movement. And, and I, I guess maybe I just don't, I'm no longer interested in, in do, trying to recreate the, any, any right. bit of that. <laughs> and, and that and that's absolutely, you know, I, I think that's absolutely right. The modeling side and the modeling a railroad from a visual perspective versus an operations perspective is, you know, a big part of the hobby. Yeah. You know, you don't. Yeah. And it's so anyway, enough said. Anybody else have any? I guess we're into the kind of sharing any, any cool modeling to share. Well, I mentioned my thing, and unfortunately, it fell apart. <laughs> it's it's always great when the stuff breaks on the way home. Um, uh, so yeah. I, well, I, is that something, Ken? I noticed I'm doing. I'm trying to do some uh, uh, custom work on a locomotive, and I'm finding that some things are fragile. You know, um, more fragile than you know when they're cast on in plastic, right? So I'm wondering if if by adding the detail and so on that that your car is more fragile than it might otherwise be. Um, it, it, it was, in my case, it was just a simple matter of, of, of the um, not packing it correctly when I put it in a box to bring home. And um, some of the, the more fragile details, uh, the, the sill steps and things like that right. got but, uh, but... bumped off and, and, uh, it's been a week and I just haven't had the, the, the time to get to, uh, or motivation to go back and fix it. Mm -hmm. Um, this has been a week. I've been away from model railroading for the most part, other than, uh, dealing with things, uh, electronically, um, uh, the couple of groups that I owe issues and things like that. Mm. So. I, I, I'm, you know, an owner and moderator of a couple of groups and it, it just, and can sometimes take a little bit of time. I guess the other thing I might say is I uh, recently came into possession of a 3D printer, a filament printer, and uh, was thinking about trying different things with it. If you look behind me, I'm, tr I'm trying to cre recreate that yeah. Jeep 9, CN Jeep 9 behind. And uh, one of the tricky things is, I don't know if you can see my, cur or I'm not sharing my screen, but if you look at the handrails, um, you'll notice that they're not standard Jeep 9 handrails. They've got these weird curves in them. And I've been trying to think of, you know, a way to recreate those curves, you know, accurately. And it occurred to me that I, if I could draw, I, I was trying to visualize how to bend them and twist them to get the right angles. And uh, like, uh, yeah, you're can we say offline this? Can you contact me and we but, can do a session? Because we've got 3D pe people 3D printing the handrails for those uh, 73 dash SC one tenders. But not probably not with filament printers, right? With rosin printers. Because I was thinking uh, I th they're, they're, they're only 20 Yeah, they're, they're probably using resin printers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because th th I was looking to try and print them. And they're only 20,000s, you know, if I keep them to scale. Uh, and uh, um, I just can't, get, you know, the filament yeah. printer is, is, for, is good to a tenth of a millimeter, but it's not going to work. I think, you know, maybe for fill scale, but but not for uh, HO well, yeah, scale. Yeah, not for HO. So yeah, instead, the, pro the well, the problem, the there, there's two or three problems with filament printers. There, I mean, one is, I mean, you're you're basically have a 40 millimeter head is the base head on most of those. You can buy thinner, you know, the nozzle basically is, it, the extruder. nozzle aperture extruder is 40 millimeters in die or not 40 millimeters, 0. 0.4, 0. Millimeters. 0.4 millimeters in diameter. You can buy 0. 0.3, 0. 0.2, 0. 0.1. Um, which makes it finer. So that's the width of the line it lays down. Yeah. And then the height you can vary about 0.1, you know, is kind of the lowest you go to. So, you know, you're, you're kind of, your resolution really is around 0.4 millimeters. Yeah. And I think for that, that handrail, it's going to be hard. Those are really small. Yeah. That, ha that handrail is in fact about 0.5 millimeters. So 0.4, yeah. 0.5. But yeah, I do have a, a 0.1 millimeter uh, filament printer. And it's interesting because when you watch the filament come out, it's just like a hair. You right, know, it's, right. it's tiny, but it takes forever to print. Um, yep. 
Um, but yeah, so I I, I thought well, I'd I mean, try to print them. Yeah, Ken, I may yeah. I may talk to you offline about uh, about trying to print them. But what I ended up doing yeah. is I, um, I, I I created a jig instead. I three pre I designed a jig with with holes in it that I could put uh, some piano wire, stiff wire, so that I could take it, Here. wrap it, twist it. Yeah, like what you're talking. That's exactly. This Those is this is resin printed. printed. Wow, it, that looks it's great. The, yeah. uh, Hold it up a little bit. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those look great. Yep. Yeah. Well, so I, I think to... resin resin printing. I mean, the thing about resin printing that's happened is, yeah, you know, so filament printing is mechanical. Yes. Resin printing is electronic. Right, because the way the that's resin the printer works is, well, no, it's, you've got a screen. And what the screen is doing is it's generating light, and that light is is basically curing a layer of resin right above the screen. Yep. And the plate the plate starts where there's just a little bit of resin between the plate, and then it cures part of that. And it lifts up. Yeah, it, it's like pulling it out of the rosin. <laughs> pulling it out exactly, exactly. So, you know what's happened is, you know the resolution. You know, there's again there's two sides to it. There's the movement this way, which is physical. Mm -hmm. which is fairly fine but the resolution this way is based on that optical thing and you know they started with cell phone uh, you know kind of the interesting thing about these resin resin printers they started with cell phone screens which were they're, three color they're also highly delicate i just broke one yeah <laughs> yeah and that, that is the other thing that's why you know but but anyway they started with those and then they went to monochrome white screens and they've been increasing the resolution. I just got a thing from somebody who has a 12K resolution. Wow. Um, resin printer. Like they went from 2K to 4K to 12K in like a year and a half. So, you know. It, although, although, although uh, Ken, I know that there are different plastics for a filament printer. Some of them are flexible more, yeah. uh, and some of them are more brittle. Looks like the, the rosins that you were using are, are more brittle. I don't yeah. know if you can get the more flexible rosins for a so, resin printer. Plastics. So the guy, the guy we need to get on and have a discussion about one of, one of, one of is, the things that happened in the printing of the, the, the 73 SC-1 was we, the first the, the couple of the guys who are working on this, different people trying to do the same thing, but they, they, they kept trying to put the rails, put, make the handrails part of the, the, the model. And print them at the same cast, time. Cast them when they were casting. Like and the, that uh, is plastic. just does not work. Um, what I've tried, these are, uh, 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 were printed from the same resin, uh, as the, uh, the, the body casting was made or body printing. And what I've got the, the guy who is doing it, he's going back and looking at other resins that are more flexible to print so, just the hand. Yeah, I think, I think so, you can, yes. I think you can get a more flexible resin. No. So the guy, the, you need to talk to Fran Foley because Fran literally has gone through this whole process because he was you know he did a bunch of little critters and he's been printing handrails and he's uses like four or five different kinds of resin so he'll tell you well, i print this and this because i get better detail or i print in this because it's more flexible so he actually really of all the people i know has the best understanding of that from a model railroading perspective I'm sure there are other people but fran's local mm -hmm. and i'm sure i can get him on here I'll, I'll ask him if we want to we can schedule it on a uh, Saturday, we've got also, you know, Jonathan Sowers, another guy who does that. We can get a couple of guys that are really good at it to come in and yeah. kind of yeah. talk about it. And it's because I know he did some handrails and he made the decision. I think he did the stanchions were printed, but the rails, the actual railings were wire. You know, yeah. that was how he did it. So, um, you know, I, I, I am actually thinking about uh, doing a brass. Uh, the problem is I haven't been able to get to the stanchions uh, for the for the to the rail and right. um, in, in metal. So that that's that's a problem. Um, printing the, the stanchions alone in, in 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 resin or whatever is is not necessarily uh, an answer because they're, they're just too fragile well that's that's to say that's why i ended up making a bending so i just got some 20 thou phosphor bronze and then found you know measured everything and then bent it bent it bent it bent it and now i got the shape um so yeah. i hadn't so instead of 3d printing the handrails it occurred to me that i could 3d print the <laughs> the jig um yeah. and uh, and that turned out to work out okay yeah 
Yeah. Anyway, it's it's this is a project that's that's sort of taking a lot of my time, but it's uh, coordinating a bunch of people who are trying to to do the same project across the country. Yeah. Cool. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Joyce's husband, and I'm here partially because we're uh, busily running around getting ready for the National Garden Railway Convention in first week of uh, hmm. July, and uh, uh, that they're going to have like over 60 layouts uh, wow. there's for that, and with people coming from other continents and stuff, so a lot of people, and uh, uh, we're we're busily trying to finish up uh, getting getting our layout ready. I'm working on the control system because I'm a I'm a control system engineer in real life, and uh, so I've got that as far as getting getting the locomotive to move, the speed, the direction, and stuff, and switching the uh, uh, moving the switches. And I'm at a point about a little more than a week in advance where I need to quickly come up with some sort of crude GUI for it so that somebody other than me can run it. I've got a command line program that nobody in their right mind would ever want to use, even me, mm. I replace it with something. Is there something relatively simple out there that I could already hook up? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure whether G, uh, JMRI counts as simple, mm. but uh, I, I assume y'all know more about this kind of stuff than I do. So I'm just trying to figure out. Yeah, what everything I've seen is proprietary. Uh, well, do you have examples, places I can look for examples of what the control screens look like? Wait a minute. There is a um, group doing a handheld throttle. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you um, uh, model railroad hobbyist uh, on their um, uh, forum. Yes. If you look for the the the, the throttle, just you, they'll, they'll, you'll see a bunch of articles in reference to to some things. It, it's sort of like a proprietary, not a proprietary thing. It's 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 more of an open. Um, what do I, I can't remember what we call it in software, but you know where you you've got a, a sort of like people just open ended working so together. Open source, you mean? Yeah, yeah, open, open source, source. yeah. So, so is this is this control for the engines or control for turnouts? Uh, or both. It's to control the engines. Now, I. No, I was asking. I, no, I, I know. Dave, uh, Dave Parks is doing some of this. He's he's added some macros that live on top of JMRI to do um, control, both controlling locomotives and controlling um, turnouts for his sort of well, autonomous operation. I don't yeah. know if any of the software so, he's got that would work. But, but uh, you're looking for a GUI. Yeah, I'm basically um, make it so that somebody yeah. else can run the thing. So or you would say run the thing. What are you running? At present, uh, the locomotive uh, speed direction and stuff, and then switching the turnouts. What the, uh, why throw? Okay. <laughs> well, so 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 yeah. So you kind of have to bifurcate those in a way, and, and then you you decide how you bring them back together, right? So the locomotive has to be controlled through dc through dcc well, and through dcc commands uh i'm actually uh dc or using dead rail he is my long-term plan but i didn't have time to remodel the guts of a locomotive to handle it so i uh it so happens oh. that, uh one of my dc locomotives responds well if you send it a pulse with oh. signal to it Local right. Fi has a plug-in app or, uh, okay. thing for you for, to to do it through Wi-Fi control. Is that, is that, so so let's let's so so again. So you have DC on the tracks. Yes, Paul, and, and you. Well, you, you for they have their large scale thing. They have some adapter for battery right. power. I understand, but let, let's let's not jump to answers. Let's let's figure out what the problem is. So the layout is running DC. Yeah. You're running P you're running PWM instead of just normal DC. I plan um, yeah, to localify doesn't work with DC. Right. It just works with DCC. So as as long as it's DC, there's really not much. there's not that much of an electronic <laughs> control system for that. Right. I mean, I mean, basically the way you know, if you look at like an MRC throttle, it's got a switch at the bottom that says 
pulse width, you know, PWM or whatever. And if you switch that, when you turn the knob, instead of varying the voltage, it does the PWM. Um, but that's all kind of just basic electrical. Yeah. Um, it, you know, there, there are two ways to, to without going to DCC, mm -hmm. there are two ways to do your engine. Mm -hmm. um, one way is to do, look at the LocoFi. Um, LocoFi makes a, is a company, there's a guy in, he's actually in, um, he's actually in, I think he's in San Ramon or, or, or down or somewhere like that. He's over here on the, on this side of the bay in Dublin, I think. Um, what he did is he built something that talks Wi-Fi to a device directly and it's all proprietary. Oh, that uh, but the thing me. is, you use a, you use just a phone to control. Right, right. So, so the it's second the answer, app. the second answer, which is is actually I think is getting to be the really good answer, is the thing called Blue Nami from oh, Soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah. So, what Blue Nami is is there was a company called um, they were called Blue Rail, and what they built was they built a little thing that would sit in your engine. And you connect the tracks to it, and it connects to any decoder. And what it has, it has a Bluetooth circuitry in it. And if you connect to that chip from your phone, it basically turns off the DC, DCC coming from the track and injects the DC signals coming from your phone. So the idea was you could buy that and put that in your engine, and now your engine runs on DC, DCC on tracks. But when you actually... When you actually um, when you connect to it with your phone, you can control it with your phone and it ignores the DCC from the tracks. Uh, bear, bear in mind that I only have nine days left to do this. In. Yeah. So that's the problem is, uh, so the problem is you have to do something to the engine, which is, is a probably a big task to do in nine days. So I think from a I'm, DC operation. Rather than DCC in the long yeah. DCC, but I don't have time for that at the moment. Uh, how, are you, how are your turnouts controlled? Uh, at the moment, I have an Arduino. That, uh, they're, they're using a, what is it, Pico 35271 or something like that switch motor, which is a G-scale size switch. Right. And I found, and people have figured out how they work. And basically what you have to do is that if you send it a positive going pulse followed by negative going pulse, it will switch to one direction. And if you send a negative going pulse uh, followed by a positive going pulse, it will switch to the other direction. And so I have a, a, four, a, a four relays shield for an Arduino that I programmed to do that and it works. Uh, yep. It requires 24 volts, which is what the per, uh, prototype used you can send it five volts and it will switch. And uh, it seems to work just fine. So that's where I'm going for, for the short term. So, so there are just, are, is that the turnouts? There are four turnouts to switch or are there uh, more? It's a, it's, a, it's a 200 foot long dog bone with two loops at the end and you have to uh, switch the uh, direction and then you have to switch the power. I, sh I should say that there's a little bit more to it than that, that I have essentially two electrical blocks. One is for the main line, and the other one is for the two is it two loops at the end. And so, uh, whenever it goes into a loop, so I have to switch the the uh, switch to the right direction. And then once it's in the loop, I have to change the polarity of the main line to be compatible right. to be back off of the loop. So you know, it strikes me that the really easy thing to do that you could probably do fairly quickly if you had a sensor in the loops. Uh -huh. That would sense an engine in the loop. Oh, I you've do. Got a, you, you've yeah. got an Arduino there. Yeah. I mean, take take your mainline track power, wire it up to a double pull, double throw relay. Take the output of the Arduino, and when you get, you know, so basically, when you you sense an engine in the loop, you mm -hmm. do two things: you throw the turnout, sure, and you you switch the relay that switch the mainline block power. Which is direct. So you can actually automate. I mean, it should be pretty easy to automate that that loop return and just automate it, right? Yeah. So an in I already have those two the the two uh, of the three things you just mentioned taken care of. What I need right. 
have an easy way to sense that the track that the loco is in the loop. That's the part that I am most interested in. So I thought there's oh yeah. yeah. The the easiest way to do it, quite frankly, would be use a photo cell. Uh, oh, um, sure. and I I don't know how you input that. I mean, I if you need them real fast, I have some. I bought there's a company called Azatrax. Um, they make a bunch of circuit boards for basically doing stuff. So they have a circuit board that they actually have a circuit board that lets you do this. It'll do the automatic flipping and that kind of stuff. Um, they sell they sell the the photo sensors, and you know because if you're 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 running pretty much in a point where you probably can put a photo sensor under the track and just sense when the train goes over it, right? And and so then you just need to take take the photo sensor, and what I don't know is how you drive the photo sensor to the Arduino because that just becomes an input to the Arduino. And then in the sketch in the Arduino, you just say, when you get this input, do these two things. And you can actually, you almost could think about doing it really stupidly and paralleling the two turnouts at either end. I do. And, and if you do that, what happens is when you hit the dot at either end, you flip both turnouts and you flip the main line, you come around and you go that way. When you get to the other end, you flip both turnouts and you flip the main line power and it goes back. Oh, I yep. can. Yeah, that, that would probably be something you could do pretty quickly. And the sensor, using a photo sensor, the problem is the other way you can do it is you can use a the detection. Mm -hmm. But the detection circuits, I think, work off of the AC nature of, you know, the, the thing about DCC is it's kind of, it's a waveform that looks like this. And I think they work off that waveform it, it, the other thing you could do is take a piece of track, mm -hmm. run your engine across it with the PWM and get one of those single cheap, they're like 15 bucks from NCE. It's called a detect, it's an NCE detector. It's a little thing. It's basically got a, a it's got a, a loop on it, a wire, and you run the track power through it and the track power current generates voltage and it detects that and it turns on an output, just switches it in and out. Okay. The, the question is, if you're running PWM, mm -hmm. do you get enough change there that it'll actually power it on? It'll detect something because I don't think it'll detect pure DC. So it might detect the PWM, though. Well, um, I, long term, I had envisioned like maybe putting magnets on the bottom of the locomotive and then detecting the presence of the magnets. That, that, that would be another way to do it. I mean, something on the locomotive, but the easy way. The easiest way to do it is probably to use a photo cell, and especially because you're probably going to be open during the day where you've got light. Yeah. So, you know, you put a photo cell in the middle of the track, just cut, drill a hole, have it there, and when the engine goes over it, it blocks the light, and that that triggers it. Uh, I, I will look into that. Uh, it uh, sounds like something that might be prone to false positives and false negatives, but uh, uh, yeah. I, well, I, I think I think what you'd probably have to do is think about the logic that says, you know, if I've got one at one end, I hit that one and I latch, I, in, my, in my sketch, I latch something so that if it hits again, nothing happens. And then when it hits the other end, it changes the state. So you basically consider the state. And, and here's Fran, who's, who's the right person to answer about handrails. Yeah. Um, and so in other, words, in other words, what happens is when you hit one photo cell on one end, you change the state to say I'm going to switch the turnouts mm -hmm. and I'm going to switch the main line. And sure. even if that, even if that one hits again, you don't do anything. Right. What happens now is when it, nothing happens until you hit the one at the other end. So basically whenever you hit one of the changes in the state. So therefore the only kind of, the only downside false positive is mm -hmm. if you've hit it at one end and it's going to the other end and somebody runs their hand over it at the other end, you can get a false positive. Yeah, well, life's like that. Um, no, no, I understand. I like I, the detector thing. I I don't know if I have any of the detectors. They probably have them. I, they may have one at just trains. They normally have those kind of things at just trains. Um, you know what I would do is if you can take a piece of track that's isolated, mm -hmm. is just connect those wires. Run one of the, you know run one of the wires. You only have to have one side. 
take a piece of track, you know, that's long enough for the engine to be in it and basically take that piece of track and connect it to a detector and then see if when the engine comes through, if the, you know, you just take a boom and see if the detector output changes. Um, because basically that's the way they work. Sure. Um, uh, ba basically, yes, that's something I wanted to do, uh, but I may have to defer that till after the show. Uh, at the moment, my plan is just to tend to walk along with the locomotive and do the right things at the right time, because uh, uh, I don't have to do it. Yeah. Means me being there doing it, but uh, it's it's my brain knows how to do automation, sort of so to speak. Uh, so, so here's another thing you could do: is you could just do it with a little wire and a limit switch. Just put a little p thin piece of wire up where it bend, where the engine goes by, it bends it back and it clicks a limit switch and just use that. And it, then you want to be directional because you always want to go in one way into the loop. So you put those in the loops on the end of the loops to detect the engine and they turn, they throw the turn out. And what you'd want to do then is you'd probably want to do it. So, you know, it, your state is always directional, right? Cause you want to go through one way, so you hit the wire and, and throw the limit switch. So you always want to go in and go left in this loop. And so what you want to do is you want to turn it right. And then when you hit the other end, you want to switch that turn. It. If you look at the dog bone, right, sure. you treat the two. So, so when you hit the loop on this end, you switch this turn. You switch both turnouts again, like we talked about. But what happens is that always switches this turnout to go right. So you come out of this one to the, on the left side. This one's going right. So you can hit that, that wire. It goes around this way. When it hits it, it turns both switches. So when you come in this one, you go right. So you're always going the same direction. And now you can just use a whisker wire to detect the engine go by. Right. And that that probably is more fail safe in some ways. It's pretty easy. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I have some of those. I have some of those those switches we got. They're nice, really nice. We have them at, at the club in Pleasanton. They're really nice um, limit switches. You know, they have they have normally open, normally closed. Right. What they have is you put a wire off of them, and you can replace that wire and put a fairly long, a longish wire that the engine would just trip it when it went by. Yeah, well, in my day job for for control systems, uh, I've used limit switches a lot, and there's all sorts of interesting ways they can fail. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're sufficiently useful that I will keep that in mind. But at the moment, I just have to. In the next walk with the engine, yep. Is is I is a, now that I've got the locomotive control and the switch control done in my uh, uh, low level control system, and actually using a control system for that I wrote for my work, which is open source by the way, and uh, it uh, so it's actually doing most of the job. I'm going to have each Arduino gets uh, attached to its own Raspberry Pi that I, that I had in a closet. And uh, so the, then the signals go back and forth to the two ends of the track actually over ethernet cable that I've run. It's not, ethernet cable's not really meant for outdoors, but it's managed to live for a year or so now. So, but uh, my, my main unsolved imponderable task for the next week is getting a user interface that isn't going to confuse people who try to use it. And uh, right. Like about the only thing that isn't proprietary is JMRI, so I may have to go in that direction anyway. Because uh, 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 basically, I've had the experience that for some of these things in the Garden Railway, the Vikings. What? Hmm. Um, the uh, uh, in the Garden Railway world, uh, people want to go to battery power, which I can see the appeal right. of power, and then I go and walk up to the vendor and ask them how do I control your battery powered system for my external computer? And they look at me like I'm crazy and say, why would you want to do that? We've already done it for you. And my answer is, is that I'm a control system engineer in my day job. And if I have you do all the control system, what's the fun in that? What part of, I mean, it's a sort of like turning on and off a TV set, you know, the job right. of the TV set is, is, is different than operating one you bought in the store. So I really want to be able to control all this stuff from my own computer because I have ideas down the load for how to, uh, uh, there, there, there will be parallel switches in some sections at, at, a point, at some point, and I'm gonna to wanna to be able to schedule them from the computer. Yep. So. No, but, there, yeah, and there are lots of, you know, and if you've got that output where you, know, you can manage it from an Arduino, then you just tell the Arduino which way to run it and it just yeah. becomes, 
Um, you know, and, and you can have those run by JMRI, the Arduino. It, there's, there's definitely, um, I mean, Seth Newman's done a lot with that, with his products to interface his Arduinos to, to JMRI. What I'm, so, plan I'm planning to do for now is that if I use JMRI, there are a couple of open source Arduino packages for DCC, and there's an old one called right. DCC++ and another one called DCC EX. And uh, I've looked at the protocol for uh, talking to those uh, uh, DCC Arduinos, and it looks uh, like it would be fairly easy for me to write an interface to it that looked to JMRI just like just like them. Right. And, uh, so that might that that sort of is my uh, one of my possible plans is just to make my stuff look like a DCC plus plus or something like yep. that. Uh, well, yeah, JR, 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 JRMI, it's pretty, they have a very defined way they talk to things, yeah. you know, especially for, for the layout control. Cause you know, that, that all came through originally, you know, most of the technology for that was that Chubb stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they have a specific way that JRMI interfaces and talks to that stuff through the computer interface. So yeah, if you, if you're comfortable mapping to that, it's pretty easy to, because you know, the, the beauty of JMRI is JMRI is a is a central control model. Right. Right. All the all the edge points are essentially stateless. Right. Mm -hmm. So so in other words, the way JMRI which is different than than the um, than the you know, D, the, there's DCC and there's LCC and LCC was kind of presented as this this way of automating your layout control but mm -hmm. the real difference between the original jmri stuff and chubb and also what seth does with his arduino based stuff is that stuff's all based on a stateless endpoint stateful centralized control and if, if sure. you decide you know what i'm talking about the problem with lcc is lcc uses a publish and subscribe model and all of the edge nodes are stateful and that's why you're able to write scripts that you know so in other words, I, I've got, I, I'm a, if I'm an LCC node and I'm controlling a turnout, I publish the state of the turnout on the bus. And if you want to know the state, if you're another node and you want to know the state of the turnout, you can subscribe and read what I'm telling you the state is. Or you can send me a message if you're the right person and tell me to change the state. But the state is known at the edge. And it turns out from a computer science perspective, managing distributed stateful systems is two orders of magnitude more complex than managing a centralized stateful system. Um, that distributed stateless control, it makes them hugely complicated to manage and operate, yeah. which, is by the, which is, by the way, the, the interesting thing I was talking about, I, I, I have a real, LCC has some great applications where you want reconfigure for a real railroad replication. The problem is railroads never use stateful endpoints, mm. right? If you, you think about think about CTC, they weren't putting stateful endpoints out there. That stuff all ran back to the core and the state was changed at the core. Things couldn't change their state out on the edge until mm. the core, I changed state. So, right. so yeah, so the, so the interesting thing is JMRI, the whole model for JMRI is that JMRI knows the state of everything and all it's telling you is endpoint you know, change your state from A to B, which A is the turnout goes one way, B is the turnout goes the other way, or it reads inputs, i.e. detectors, et cetera. And then you can write logic around that, right? The routing paths, et cetera. So it, it's, a, it's a really basic model when you look at it that way. So if you're creating an endpoint, as long as you're creating stateless endpoints, it's good. Now, you know, the problem is, the problem with JMRI is if you have local control of the turnout where you can switch it locally, then you have to provide, you have to think about providing a way back to JMRI to tell it what the state is. So sure. you know, if JMRI can, it's, it's an interesting thought process. If the JMRI controls the turnout, you really don't need something physically telling you which way the turnout is going because the probability, if you built a, you know, you've got a model railroad, you built a turnout, you put an actuator on it, some sort of a, you know, whether it's a tortoise or something else, an electrical actuator for the turnout, if you give the turnout a signal that says change state, yeah. the probability it's going to fail is minuscule. Yeah. And by, but, 
tend to account. Certainly uh, in my day job work, uh, you have that just because you told something to do something, that doesn't mean it actually did it. No, no, I understand. In the real world, the impacts are different. But in a model railroad, you know, if, if, I, if I'm running 100 turnouts on my model mm -hmm. and I'm running it with centralized JMRI control mm -hmm. and one turnout every year fails, it's not catastrophic. It's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, on, and, but when you look at the feedback cost, so this is the, the, the challenge is if you want to get feedback, you've got to run essentially a couple of wires from every turnout. Mm -hmm. Now you may do on your Arduino. So if you've got, you know, so if you've got a, a tortoise, you've got to take the output off of one of the real, one of the, the, the switches in the tortoise. So you actually have input back to JMRI. So for example, if, if you say, if you wire it so that you take the power coming from the central computer and you run that through a double pull, double throw switch, that's a local switch to change the direction of the turnout. And then you run that to the switch motor. Yep. You can now change the direction of the turnout locally and the computer doesn't know where it's switched. So what you have to do then is run two wires back or at least one, but generally two, back from the turnout to GRMI and sense the input. So on the drawing, regardless of if you push the button to change the turnout, it'll show the direction. If somebody flips the button out there remotely, it'll show the turnout. So the direction on the diagram is not shown by what you pushed, but is shown by the actual state. And, and that's the problem with distributed state. If you allow state to be changed remotely, you have to re-aggregate that. By the way, my, my background, I was a telecom guy and did all the VoIP stuff back in the day. And this became a big issue because the original PBXs, the original phone systems, all had stateless endpoints. You know, that phone on your desk at business or a phone in your house, they're stateless. They don't know anything. You push a button, they don't do anything except send something up the wire and says, you push button number four. Sure. And the decision about what button number four does, and it transfers or drops or whatever, that's all made up at the center. And right. the endpoint doesn't know. When we went to voice over IP, it was obviously going to an IP network where you had endpoints that were stateful. And the original protocols was, you know, I could run something on my PC. And if I had your IP address, I could send a request to your IP address to have a phone call. And we could have a phone call just between our two nodes and I could hang up in my PC and it would hang up and the phone call would go away. The problem is when you try to put centralized control on that, you know, you and I are in a phone call. When I push the button to drop, my node drops. The central node doesn't know that I've dropped. I've got to have a way of getting that state up to the central node. So it knows I'm available for the next phone call. And it just tr turns out, so it's interesting when you look at JMRI, it's, it's, it's very interesting to understand that it operates very much in that, you know, centralized stateful control like the old, and that really is the way the old CTC systems used to work. Because, you know, there were no computers. You know, if, if you look at out where there was a, an interconnect, mm -hmm. there, were no, there was no local computer to run the interconnect. Mm -hmm. All the wires from the interconnect ran back to the CTC system. One uh, difference in my situation is that, of course, garden railways are always outside. Well, not yep. all, but ours is. And uh, you often get things like leaves from hedges and seeds and rocks and goodness knows what down there. So you, yeah, the, the likelihood that the switch will fail becomes much larger when if you have random stuff uh, dropped oh, yeah. Uh, and if you're using Arduino, by the way, do you have sensing on the Arduino already? I can. I have not yet done that yet. Okay. For next week, I will probably just follow the exhibits. Like, given that it's a DCC, I'm sorry, that it's a DC pulse with modulation, I can only have one locomotive on the track anyway. Right. So just walk along the track with, uh, with a control. I'm probably going to use an Arduino tablet with something that I'll have to put on it. And... Uh, uh, and deal with it if the switch doesn't switch. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I, one way you can sometimes deal with things like that is that if it sort of if it sort of switches most of the time, but not all the time, you just do things like send the the switch command three times in a row, and uh, that often deals with things of that sort. Not always. If it's got a rock blocking the switch, it ain't going to deal with that. But uh, 
Well, you, you know what you might want to do, it would be really easy to do. You could do this before next week mm-hmm. is on your Arduino, have an input button for a shorted input switch that throws the switches. Mm-hmm. And if you do that, you can put a switch that will throw the switches in three locations. You can put one at either end and one in the middle. So basically, you don't have to go down there. So if you're set, if you're talking to somebody at one end, you got a 200 foot layout, you're at one end talking to somebody and the engines run to the far end. When you see it go into the loop, you just reach down and push the button there and it'll turn, throw the switches. If you're in the middle, you got a button to push or you can go down and push it at the far end. So the idea is you don't have to walk with the locomotive and throw the switch. You'll be able to throw the switch from anywhere. You just have to see, oh, the locomotive is going in the loop. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the other thing you could do, and this would be really, again, pretty easy, mm-hmm. would be to take an output off the Arduino and take a, tr- a piece of track in the loop mm-hmm. and have it set up so that when the engine comes in the loop, that track's unpowered. So when the engine comes into that piece of track, it actually stops. And then when you push the turnout button, it flips the turnout and it turns that power back on that track so the engine runs. So you could actually, you could actually with just a, a little few lines and a sketch in an Arduino and an output to a relay and a few input switches, you could actually make it so that it automated it and the locomotive would stop in the loop. It, it's kind of like having the photo sensor and throwing the switch, except you're the automation. But the beauty is it won't run around and short out. It'll stop and you push a button and then it starts up again and goes around. Um, well, you know, I'm going to do best I can in the next yep. month. Uh, I certainly plan to go to JMRI after this is all over with. But if you've got an Ethernet cable out there, you know, running, running three switches, because you just parallel the switches, because the way the switches work is they short the inputs. Mm-hmm. So you can have three buttons off of one wire, and whichever one you push shorts it. So you just run those in a Cat5 cable, and you can put, you know, you can put, two or three switches in places where people can't see them. And anytime you push that switch, it'll throw the turnouts. So it's well, easy to control the turnouts. Yeah, well, I, I, actually I'm, I'm using a network, uh, a network control system. So uh, getting a signal from one end of the 200 line thing to the other end is easy. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, so then it's just having the input. So you got a button to push or. Sure, and that's probably gonna be on a tablet. Okay. Yeah, you could do it. And if you've got it, you put it on a tablet, you can do it that way. But, but like I said, the, the, the other thing you can do is if you have a track that a die that isolates it, you can, it'll stop the engine on that block. And then when you, if you take an output from your Arduino that turns that on, so you basically turn that one on and turn the one off at the other end. And then the train runs around when it hits the block at the other end, that turns it off. So you basically, you think about that the switch has two directions. When you come up to the turnout, it's set for right. You go right into the loop. You hit the stop block and it stops if the turnout has not been switched to the left. If you've already switched the turnout to the left, it'll just keep going. But if you haven't, it stops until you switch it to the left. So you kind of use a little bit of logic. Like it's not a lot of logic to build really. True, but I predict that a lot of garden railway people will look at that and say, What's wrong with that? Why is it doing that? that right. No, no. I, no, it's just, it's just the idea of not having it. My problem, my problem is, and Fran's here, so he'll tell you, when the public's around, I get engaged talking to people and I forget about the train. Which, well, uh, we've got like three other people coming. I, I will say that uh, if, if any of those out there want to come and help us with this, we would welcome the help. But... Uh, I- I personally, I, by the way, I would love to, but you know, the problem is those, the garden railway guys scheduled this right in the middle of the Pleasanton fair. And, yeah. you know, Seth, Seth is, uh, Seth Abrams and Bruce Jan are both members and they're both very active. So we are actually losing two members already to the garden railway and I have to work. <laughs> unfortunately. I do. It's, uh, to with but i'm you know like taking some time off so uh, oh, no no this is not work work i've got to go volunteer at the fair we have to be open we're open from noon to 11 o'clock wednesdays through sundays through july 9th 
Oh. So, yeah. So it, it just turns out that it's a real conflict for us having the Garden Railroad at the same time we have to be open for the fair. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, but you can probably understand that finding a convention center that can schedule you, you it, have to. It, it wouldn't be a consideration in my mind if I was running the Garden Railroad. The fact that it conflicts with the Pleasant and Fair wouldn't be a thought process. It just it creates a, an issue for us, especially on the OSCO side, because of the volunteers we have, about 25% are going to be going to the Garden Railway. And so when you take that off, it makes it a challenge. Um, I mean, there are definitely a few nights where I'm the only person there. Yeah. So okay. I'm probably let the rest of people talk. If they cool. Sorry. Everybody's quiet. And so Fran, Fran, there were some questions about different kinds of resins and casting handrails. And, um, and I think actually the folks that asked them are no longer here. Might be good in, that, in a couple of weeks if you're going to be to have kind of a Q&A around resins. Because I know you've done a lot of work with different kinds of resins and, you know, strength versus flexibility versus fine detail. And I, I guess there are some variables there. I don't understand them. You understand them much better than I do. But, if, you know, there's kind of a trade off of, of strength versus the detail you can get into versus um you know flexibility versus so there's the, the, another issue is um some of the resins in fact all, all any any of them that i'm running into when you get down to handrail sizes for like o scale uh by the time you get a, a mixture or a formula that is not going to be brittle and break as a handrail it's almost too floppy it's, it's trying to find that line between something that has a certain amount of flex, it'll spring back, and it'll, it'll still a certain amount of rigid, rigidity, uh, but not have any brittleness. If it is a handrail, no brittleness to it at all. Um, my, my, my preference will always be I, I look for ways to do it with brass rod, and, and if you're going to print something, print your bending jigs for the brass rod. Um, uh, the P, uh, PLA, I do some handrails and, uh, like, uh, grills that are, that are pretty fine, but they're really barely fine enough for O scale. It'd be like, it would be like a handrail of about two or two and a half inches in O scale, which you might find on a big locomotive, but, uh. I, I tell you what, we probably, I think the folks that were mainly interested aren't here. So uh, maybe we'll talk and see if we can set that up and, and have a, um, a discussion. Maybe, I'll see if I can get Jonathan to come too. Maybe we can have a 3D, a 3D printing, um, I don't know what you want to call it, Q&A session, discussion session about it. Because I, I know that's, you know, it, what's becoming clear is, you know, we talked about this. They introduced all these new 4K and now 8K and now 12K printers. And the price of the 2K printers is just going through the floor. I mean, I just got an ad, I think, for 159 or something for a printer yeah. from any cubic. And yeah. so, you know, I think what we're seeing is more and more people kind of biting the bullet and buying them. Um, the question actually came about a filament printer, but, you know, they're kind of both sides. So always interesting. It's good to support folks. So. Yeah, yeah, we, we could do that. This morning, I uh, I don't know what happened. I was all ready to tune in, and uh, I got into something else, and it was 1030. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Fran, it was uh, Ken Adams was the one asking. He was, you know, he, had, uh, he was dealing with some stanchions that were breaking or handrails that were breaking, and I forget, somebody else mentioned the yeah. fact that he used brittle resin as opposed to more flexible resin, and that's where the discussion came out. Yep. Yeah, and Ken, Ken's doing HO also, which is yep. getting getting tough. Um, you know that, that the stuff Bachman uses, I presume, is must be something like Delrin when they when uh, like on the Bachman uh, O scale stuff. I see like more of a Delrin type of uh, handrail, and they don't hold up real well. Like right. on, on the little Davenport, those handrails don't hold up real well. Yeah. It's all, it's all very, uh, 
very mysterious to me, all these different things, like mixing the formulas up. Yeah. So, also, that was, a lot more realistic than the old blue boxes, which had the steel handrails and the stanchions, you kind of slid over them. <laughs> yep. And actually, friend, I was going to ask you to send me or I'll give you a link to upload some of your pictures from Roaring Camp. I was going to try to put those somewhere. Um, I was going to try to put some put some sort of a a thing up. I think they're I think people are kind of interested in one people to understand what they missed if they didn't come. Um, yeah, you know what we, yeah I think I'll, I'll send you what I have. I, I didn't take a whole lot, but I'll send you what I have. Yep. I thought it, you know, again, you, what was your reaction? Was it worthwhile going down there and spending well, the definitely, day? Definitely, it, it, it was. Uh, it's one of the, um, you know, I don't have a whole lot of experience or a whole lot of uh, shop uh, tours. Uh, maybe maybe a, a few and a half a dozen. And I think it was the better, the best or the better of, of, of what I had so far a lot of times. Uh, steam. I didn't go to the steam up because every steam up I've been to is kind of like it's a little bit like watching paint dry fast. Mm -hmm. um, yet the guys weren't. I mean, I've never had guys really explain uh, a good startup uh, other than you know throw an oil rag in there and get the thing. Now that this this one I guess would have been much better seeing them using the uh, the piped in gas. But, yep. um Once. The heat is on it's just a waiting game yeah that, that's true there was a lot of kind of just hanging out there there was about an hour of hanging out from got there at 8 30 and they pulled the locomotives out by by nine o'clock i think they had both of them you know with the natural gas steaming up and you know from then on it was basically like doing the oil and that kind of stuff there was not there's not much exciting activity until they actually start you know running the engines out and unfortunately, they ran the engines out. I I totally missed the blowdown that they do right yeah. at the beginning. So that would have been kind of cool to have caught. But uh, but uh, the guy who did the uh, was it Phil? The guy who did Phil. The, uh, yep. Yeah, uh, it, was, it was a pleasure just getting his getting his take on things and and seeing you know how you know the the, the calm long the long haul of that kind of work of working on steam engines um it, it was good you know, you well, know when i was in college i had a friend who knew a high level mucky muck over at bart and he actually got us uh, arranged for us to have a shop tour of the park facility there in south hayward sure it'd be nice to have something like that during the uh convention yeah, so that's that's one of the things, you know, I, I the problem is I need to find you can't do those things generally unless you find somebody who's got an in. Yeah. Um, you know, there are two there are two there are two facilities we could go to that are close. Um, one is the Valley Transportation, which is actually closer because um, it's right off of 237 there. As you go across this bay, it's right there south of 237. So it's literally three miles from the hotel. You know, it's no more than three miles or BART would be the other one. So, you know, if, if anybody knows, I, you know, I've kind of got to put the call out that if anybody knows anybody there, I mean, they don't need to coordinate. They just need to need an in for somebody who will get us in the door. Um, and because uh, those, those would be the two prototype tours that, you know, would be actual prototypes where the other two things we can do is go to you know, trying to do something with Niles Canyon, um, you know, and, and trying to think about what we could do with Niles Canyon that would be interesting. My one thought was to true, do like a photo train, you know, do something and it probably would cost. So the question there is, you know, if you do something like that, when we did the, we did the shop tour with Niles Canyon before it didn't cost anything, but if we ask them to do something like a train, then there is a cost. So one of the questions kind of ask them is, you know, if we do a train, you know, if you have, if you have a, you know, so the idea would be go over, go over there to Snow, catch the train, drive it a ways, get off, do a couple of photo passes, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe combine that with a shop tour. If there's enough time, kind of go with the timing of it. Um, you know, the question is, would people pay 50 or hundred bucks to go do that? So, you know, just to give you an idea, 
I'm doing a one day thing on the cumbersome toll tax for the narrow gauge convention. And I think it was $365 for the day. So, you know, those things. So that's, that's the question what people really, and I just don't know if people would want to do that. Then at Ardenwood, you know, one of the questions we got to sit down with, with Jackie and, and talk to her about doing something with the Carter, Carter brothers, um, preservation society and i you know this is actually friends out there a lot so one of the questions is what can we do there that would be really interesting for folks to go do um you know even to the point of figuring out can we have somebody actually do some work or something you know i i don't you know i'm, I'm really i think it's interesting to consider what are the things that people would find fun to do that you can't normally do um you know be interesting to say we're gonna have, have go out and we're gonna do a shop tour we're gonna do a train ride and then we're going to get together and we're going to lay um, four, five ties in a piece of track and go through the process. I, you know, so, so things that we never get to do, right? Unless you're part of the group that's there. So Fran, that would be actually interesting to think about is what can we do that would be really cool that you guys do? And it could even be worky that we could figure out how to do for as, a, as an option there. Um, and then the shop tours at the, the couple of railroad facilities, I, you know, as far as I know, the UP doesn't have really anything here. Um, I think they've moved everything out of the Bay Area from a labor cost perspective. Well, no, we have the, uh, I just looked it up. Caltrain has uh, their maintenance facility down at Deerdon Station in San Jose. So that would be another one we could do as Caltrain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, one of the challenges we've got is I've got to find someone who wants to do prototype tours and kind of take it on for the convention. You know, as a task, because right now it's me, and and quite frankly, I'm going to overload pretty quick on this stuff. So, so that's a great task if somebody wants to take it on. Mm -hmm. It's actually fun. I mean, you know, it, you know, quite frankly, there's a lot of fun in dealing with in talking to the people and setting some of these things up. You get to, you know, go figure some stuff out. And anyway, well, I'm going to bail because I've got to go get ready to go down to the fair. <laughs> um, where we're, you know, it, well, it's, it's interesting. We had 2,000 visitors yesterday, which is pretty reasonable. So um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's, it's always interesting. We had somebody show up yesterday, a guy who says, you know, I've been coming to the fair for 20 years and I never knew this was here. So it's always fun to, to get those. Yeah. All right. Well, enjoy, enjoy your day there, Phil. Super, guys. Everybody have a great one and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Take Thanks, care. guys. Bye now.